I am not like the senior person in the firm. And so I've been trying to bring young people. Most of the people in the firm are between like 40 and 53. And so we're trying to get that generation uh, to take over. I had two goals uh, in starting my firm. One was to be in the top 10, and two, to make a successful transition to the next generation. Mm -hmm. uh, very few African-American firms in the history of America, or small firms, have done that, whether it's Ebony or mm -hmm. Thacker Construction Company or any of these other second generation kids don't want to do yeah. what their parents did. And so what I wanted to do is to be a second generation Goldman Sachs. And so I've identified a couple of people. Uh, we've hired, we just hired this great young kid. Uh, he's not that young, but very interesting background. He grew up in Caribbean Uranium, which is the worst project in oh, Chicago. In Chicago. Went to Howard and graduated and then he became the first African-American to make law review at Notre Dame. And he used to work directly with Jimmy Dimon at uh, J.P. Morgan. And uh, worked in mergers and acquisitions. And he joined us in June of last year. Hmm. And so his name is Gary Hall Jr. He'll become a partner sometime in the very short distance. And then hopefully, uh, eventually he'll become chairman, and I can become chairman emeritus. <laughs> <laughs> Just hang out with that. <laughs> Any other questions? Oh, and that, another one. Two-part question. What were some of the challenges when you started your firm, and how did you go about getting customers? Um, what, see, I thought about this a long time before I started my firm. That's what it sounded like. And so what I did with, with my uh, first partner, what I did was I said, you go out and raise a million dollars in the capital. I'm going to take this, this, America, this American Express card and develop a list of clients that will be loyal to me. And at whatever point in time I thought this would be loyal to me, then I would jump and we would start this firm. So it wasn't like I just said I went and started a firm. I had a pretty good idea uh, how I would do that. And then with customers, uh, and that came from working in the public sector. I had all these Wall Street firms come down and pitch me every day about how to, you know, why don't you hire me? And these are our qualifications. And so I took the best approach from all of them and developed my own strategy of how to convince people to hire me. And it's very unique in how you do that, you know, because why should I hire you when I can hire Goldman Sachs or Merrill Lynch? J.P. Morgan, Morgan Stanley, and that's what we face every day. But because we can convince them that we have a better understanding of your needs as this city or this county, and we can actually do a better job because 100% of our focus is on the municipal around the world. Mm -hmm. We're not focused on commodities or oil or gold or any of that. We're focused strictly on you. The big firms, you know, they don't look at it like that. They look at who pays them the most amount of money. And so local government is really not as important to them. And they can do a big deal for Exxon, like this pipeline we're about to build in Alaska. They don't care about our county in reality because the amount of money they make is probably 2,000 times more. So, what's wrong with you, Google? <laughs> so, it was really developing a niche in your area of expertise and, and really taking advantage of that. That's it. Thank you. Did you have a second question in the back there? Another question? Oh, over here. Oh, yes. we're gonna make you go. Oh, Professor, yeah, we'll do that there. What strategies do you think municipal finance departments are going to have to employ? to overcome the huge pension liabilities they've been building up the last decade? Now that's a $99,000 question. Mm -hmm. um, the problem with retirement systems, well, twofold. 80% uh, of municipal budget is police and fire. Mm -hmm. Retirement systems are a 
of these in part. Not the average worker was a secretary or a sanitary worker, and they're not getting paid the big bucks. It's police and fire, and most of the firemen working all this overtime. And then you're retired at 50 and all of this. And so, uh, and then it's compounded by they're very active politically. And so they give money to elected officials who, because of term limits, are not going to be there that long. So they agree to continue this whole process. And so what you're seeing is, you're seeing people file bankruptcy to get out of it. But they're filing bankruptcy not to default on debt, but strictly to force restructuring of this retirement system. Mm -hmm. And there will be, there, there will become a, uh, San Jose is an interesting case study. The mayor has put on a ballot, uh, a referendum, and I think it passed, to restructure the retirement system for the city of San Jose. And so you're gonna, see, you're gonna find more fiscally prudent people who are going to force the, uh, those two particular units to change the way they operate. Now there's a little abuse in the uh, administrative side by county managers and you know people, one or two people who can manipulate to a higher amount, but that's ministry versus the police and fire. And uh, somewhere along the line, we're going to deal with it. But that's the biggest question. And that's why the rating agencies don't have the impact on the bond world because all of the investment uh, firms like Franklin Bond and Schroeder and people like that, they're focused 100% on that. That's where they see the biggest potential liability. But when it comes to the security of municipal bonds, the first call on revenue is usually to pay debt service and bonds. That's why bonds are still very secure. As long as you stay away from peripheral debt, which is like housing, dirt bonds, and things like that. But if the government has to, by charter, and that's one of the reasons we're actually pushing about our success. When I started this firm, when I worked in government, I knew by charter we had to provide streets, sanitation, transportation, security at the airport, water, wastewater treatment. And so I focus all of our emphasis on that particular field rather than on some of this peripheral stuff. Because by charter, you have to do this. So you have to, you have to do this by charter. And so that was a way to ensure or increase the likelihood of being successful by doing that. Mm -hmm. But that is the uh, number one issue in the market right mm -hmm. now is police and fire retirement system. Kathy. Hello. Thank you again for uh, coming and speaking with us. And Kathy, I think that when I run a uh, scholarship and leadership development program for undergraduate students here at the high school, and I wanted to ask you, what is the, the biggest professional risk that you've taken in your career that didn't pay off, and uh, what you what you're learning from it, how you've used it going forward? That's a good question. Uh, I don't. I can't think of one. Did, how about maybe didn't work out the way you thought it would? That's every day. If there is no the best laid plans of mice and men, you have to be uh, very flexible and you have to improvise. Uh, but professionally, uh, only thing that didn't work out was, again, playing professional basketball. <laughs> so that's when I decided to make that switch to find out what it was that I wanted out of it. But uh, from a professional standpoint, uh, I can't think of anything. Thank you. Um, hi, my name is Anika Lansing. I'm an attorney here in Fort Lauderdale. And I've spent most of my career in public finance. I'm a member of the National Association of Bond Lawyers. Oh, wow. <laughs> so I was uh, curious to ask you, the municipal advisor regulations, the municipal advisor role that was created as part of the Dodd-Frank Act, uh, does Secret Frankfurt see an opportunity there um, to grow a new line of business in the municipal advisor area? Do you think that's going to end up uh, getting driven to smaller operators? How do you see that developing? We, we are actually trying to figure that rule out. You know, it was this force from us, as you know, at the end. Thank God we got a July 1 deadline. 
And we are really trying to figure out how we're going to operate. And a lot is going to depend if we can get these issuers. And Chicago is taking a good step. They said that we are, this is our financial advisor, and so and put it on the website. So that sort of, from that perspective, complied with that rule. But uh, whether people were willing to do that, willing to pay more for that, I mean, really, really working through that. That was that's what I was saying earlier about the whole cost administration. If you don't understand how to work through the uh, work through the bureaucracy, it's a real challenge. And um, that is uh, the biggest nightmare that caught everybody off guard. And uh, maybe we have a solution. <laughs> but, it, but it's a real challenge, and we're really working through it. And uh, hopefully, uh, we'll be able to figure something out. Because it will change the way. Because in theory, we can't call the clients anymore. But you can't. What the rules basically says is that you can't act as a municipal advisor without certain um, guarantees to the client. And so you can't make presentations anymore and talk about how we can help you. You can only say what we've done for you in the past. That's a very tough way to like market. You know. and so uh, people are going through that whole process. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a nightmare. I know a lot of uh, firms like. I won't mention the firm name, but it's been told me, we're about to lay off all, we're about to lay off all our analysts. So I'm going to say, I don't know. We don't need them anymore. If we can't give people ideas, we can only market to them based upon our relationship. How easy is that? <laughs> Might be. But it's a it's one of the top three firms on Wall Street, as a financial advisory category. Not all of them, but you know, 50, 60%. Uh, I said things that go wrong, but nothing that had a major effect. But I think um, uh, everything I've done pretty much, I view it as a mission. And a mission means more than, from my perspective, than anything. It's a spiritual undertaking. Mm. And so I've always liked to view it like, if I was never in the military, but like taking a hill. Whatever you have to do to be successful, that's legal. Mm. <laughs> Should we say that? That you will do. And that means the level of effort you have to do. And so all the resources that you learn in your whole life, all the experience you experienced as a kid growing up, whether you were bullied or this or that, and you have to figure out how to use that as a positive effort. And um, uh, faith is very, very important. Mm. And you just can't never give up. And in any circumstances, you just, you're not going to let that defeat you. Perfect segue. Oh, one more? All right. Final question. Can you share a little bit about your feelings on the importance of giving back? Yeah, we have. Uh, giving back is extremely important. That's one of the things that um, we do personally. Uh, we have a couple of foundations we've set up to help kids. Uh, as a firm, uh, we don't say this publicly, but basically we tithe. You know, we take a certain percentage of our money, we set aside, and that we give it uh, to what we call targeted, targeted groups. Uh, and so and they, tend be, they tend to be uh, poor nonprofits. Uh, that's one of the reasons I'm most proud of is the uh, uh, Rocker Street Project. Which is uh, one of those kids who come to San Francisco. Uh, we support that big time. Uh, because those are the kids that are at the bottom. And so the big firms like Goldman and B of A, we give the operating incentive and things like that. We target most of ours to uh, groups like that, like the uh, Johnny Holmes aid, aid, uh, aid group in uh, South Dallas, which is all over the country. We try to target ours on that, so we really give it back financially, and we also we give back from our time, uh, and we give back in terms of our ideas and we always have internship for kids. 
all over the country, uh, starting in high school, and even college kids uh, who just want to get exposure. Because I didn't realize until I, until a few years ago, one of the reasons why I was very successful getting, very successful getting jobs, my first job was working as a, as a stock boy at the King of the Key store, which is like a Publix in high school. And then, so I worked as a stock boy and went to school. And so for a kid at 16, by the time, and they had to wear a shirt and tie, be on time and all that, and play basketball, and went to school, I didn't realize that people view that as, wow, this kid is pretty uh, ambitious, but he's also- And disciplined. And disciplined. Mm -hmm. You know, and so, and that really helped me. So when I got down to work at Standard Oil in the summertime, or Union Carbide, I did a dirty job shoving asphalt. But they saw Union Carbide on the resume, they mm -hmm. saw Standard Oil. It was like, wow. This young kid came from out of here, he's a brilliant athlete, he's like disciplined and all this, and so that was very helpful. And so I really hurt, I would really encourage young people to get jobs early on, especially if you get a job in a retail organization, because you learn how to deal with people. Maybe not as much as you used to, but you still get a chance to deal with people. And interaction with people is everything. Uh, I am all, I'm virtually off the grid. I don't text. I have no email. Uh, well, I tell you, the email goes to my secretary. But I don't have email because she has to have the documents, you know, lawyers and documents on email. And um, people said, why, why don't you have technology? I said, very simply, there are no deals on email. If I can get hired, get some, convince somebody to pay me, just like I did on the internet, I would be on the internet. It takes interaction while I'm busy with clients, one on one, uh, and sharing my knowledge and taking them to lunch, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, cultivating relationships. And that's what's missing today. And so if a young person can actually do that, plus have technology, mm -hmm. you'd be way ahead of the curve in terms of your competitors. A final question from me. Okay. <laughs> so. You've obviously maintained a wonderful marriage for a long time. So how do you keep a time for personal life and, uh, you know, having a family and uh, time with Sharon? Well, fortunately, uh, we've both been very active. And so virtually from the time we got, we got married in college. And so she was going to school full time and working. And so was I. And so it's always been this uh, uh, partnership of working. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll be celebrating our 38th uh, anniversary in May 21st of this year. And so it's, uh, it's been a wonderful ride. And uh, without the support of a yeah. loving wife, uh, a lot of stuff couldn't have done mm -hmm. because uh, somebody has to have your back. And, uh, and if you have that, then it makes all the difference in the world. But as I said, uh, I was very fortunate to be selected in the uh, men's book called Men of Courage. It's 24 young men who, made, who come from very humble beginnings, like Ron Brown, mm -hmm. Jack A. Lee Brooks, and people like that. I was fortunate to chosen one of those people. They actually threw me a quote. What did the one in me would say? And my quote was, you can't let anything or anybody deter you from your dream. Perfect ending. If you'll join me in thanking Napoleon Brandt for being here. Okay, so a small token of our appreciation. We have a certificate for you for serving as part of our Distinguished Lecture Series. And I hope you all enjoy this as much as I did. I found a lot of inspiration, a lot of good knowledge. I'll be able to show off in some conversations and made a new friend for NSU. So thank you very much. Thank you.